Hi, welcome to Just Another Army Vet 2.0, which is all about Indian content. For those of you who are new, I'm Kylie, and I'm a former combat medic for the U.S. Army. I have another channel called Just Another Army Vet, which is all about military and defense. Today's video comes from the channel Char Udada Galande, and it is Colonel Lalit Ray, VRC of the Indian Army, Cargo War Story. I don't know much about this gentleman except that he was a Gurkha and he fought in the Cargo War. Because of the length of this video, I will make this three parts. So this is part one. Let's get to it. So if I'm not mistaken, the Veer Chakra, I believe, is an award for valor. If I'm wrong, then please correct me. Uh, the stories I heard, and he was very, very extremely humble in his uh, state. I got his card, and I, in fact, I didn't read his card till I got into the car, and then I stopped my car somewhere, I think, uh, beyond the Pune Club, and I saw him read it in the light of the car, and it was written Veer Chakra, and he had never mentioned it to me that he was a Veer Chakra, so I was, uh, it was the first thing you do is normally, uh, guys like us mentioned that, listen, I was a Veer Chakra and all that, but Colonel uh, Lalit made sure that uh, he gave no impression about it. And what was most interesting, and uh, Satish, you'll do the formal uh, introduction of Sorry for because you went out, so I, I usurped your time. Well, uh, why I want you guys to, uh, all of you to hear it is because, uh, and he told me is that you guys, you, it's mandatory for all of us to hear the stories of Kargil because some of us don't get to know about what actually happened. And it fundamentally shows, I think it's more interesting to see that, you know, when we talk in business, we talk about leadership and all this stuff. And uh, the fact is that you, I don't think there's a more, uh, uh, naked and an honest form of leadership than um, you know uh, men fighting with the soldiers in a battle. I think that's the actual test of leadership. Everything else in uh, in management terms is jargon and nice things to you know talk about and hear we speak. But this is leadership in action. Uh, and uh, what I was doing my interaction, what I really admired was uh, throughout this statement, it was this uh, outstanding commitment uh, or loyalty to subordinates, which is a rare quality. Okay. You see outstanding commitment to bosses in our kind of environment. Right? Yes. And that is fundamentally what makes a difference between outstanding leadership and, uh, uh, you know, a pedestrian kind of a, a hierarchy, what I would say. In my words of English, I mean, which I can, that's pedestrian. If you have outstanding loyalty to seniors, it's a highly uh, mutated form of a leadership. And uh, that's why I'm going to not uh, take away the charm of uh, his experience. But uh, I think it's a great honor that, sir, you've come to Cummins Diesel because it's really great honor to see a Veer Chakra fundamentally. And what you won't know, uh, but he'll also share with you the Parambi Chakra, one of the boys who won the Parambi Chakra was in his unit. And more interesting, and he refused to tell you that, but here is a leadership, he was pulled out of a different unit when the Kargil war started. So this is not his unit. I know he'll share with you. This is his father's unit and he never worked in this unit. So imagine going into a war with not knowing the people under you, okay, into a crisis situation, purely based on your professional experience and trusting people who have never met the day before. It's like, you know, coming to, I mean, 100 times more expense, uh, difficult than, you know, coming to CDSs one day and then achieving the 150% AOP. Okay. <laughs> seriously, the next quarter. So you can imagine how difficult it is. Okay. And seriously, so I was amazed when I heard this story. I was amazed that a guy can be pulled up during a war and sent to a different unit. He doesn't know anybody from Adam or Eve. And I think it's an outstanding exhibition of leadership. And I don't want to deprive you. I mean, I would just ask Satish to just do the form. Just read the formal introduction of uh, Colonel and then I'll leave it up to... And once again, thank you, sir. And I had a meeting, so I asked him uh, that, look, I have an extremely crucial meeting at Four Kuri pre and he was gracious enough to come uh, a bit earlier. And I think he's been uh, really sweet of you. Thank you. So, Colonel Lalit Rai is a beer checker recipient, like uh, Chief explained. He's from Bishop Squadron School, Bangalore. And uh, subsequently, he joined the Army as, in the, as an infantryman, and he joined the... Uh, 11 Gurkha Rifles. Further to that, of course, during his 25 years of service, he has been in, in the various uh, command and staff appointments all over. Uh, he has done, has, uh, he's also post-graduated from the College of Defense Management, and he recently has also come, uh, returned from the Never Postgraduate School at Montgomery, U.S. Uh, prior to that, he has commanded the 17 Rashtriya Rifles and we keep hearing about in the news is the Doda district in Jammu and Kashmir and he was very much there and fighting out insurgency and militants. And uh, <coughs> his battalion which he, he is rightly christened the Stormy 17. He's a very active and a keen sportsman and a mountaineer. And apart from that, 
He is also a all-round sportsman, enjoys playing golf, tennis and other games. Uh, in June 1999, Colonel Dry took over the command of 11 Golkhas and uh, he led the battalion into the battles of Kargil War, which we heard about it in the news. Probably we heard, we, first time we were slightly near to it, watching it through, on, through the channels, but here we now an experience, a first-hand experience of what actually happened. Uh, we heard of the Batalic sector in Kargil, at, that's an altitude of over 18,000 feet. And he has been, he was very much there, and he's had uh, bullet and splinter injuries on his legs. And in spite of his bleeding, he he was a he led his as a commanding officer led his men into the war. Uh, because of the exceptional order and inspirational leadership, like what also chief, our chief mentioned. Uh, the president awarded the wheel chakra to him. And uh, <clears throat> uh, in his battalion was also coveted the Chief of Army Staff Unit Citation, which is the bravest of the brave. Uh, and that is what was in the Operation Vijay. So, with that small little introduction, I'll hand over to Colonel Dry to share his experiences of the cargo war. Colonel Dry, please. Right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I must put on record that it is a great pleasure and honor to be here in front of you today. And I must be thankful to one gentleman who is sitting down here, that is your chief. We also have a chief back in Delhi. And uh, I must say, you have a very dynamic chief. And after having gone through or heard about what all he did in life before he came here, I am all praise for him. And because I share his love for dynamism in life, and I am a man who's got a lot of josh and activity within, like your chief, we hit it off well. I mean, that's why I'm here. And uh, when, he, when the request came for me to give you a talk, I said, he's one man I cannot refuse. Besides, it's always a pleasure interacting with good people. Right. Very kind words were spoken about me. I'm very thankful for that. Now I'll come down to the talk proper. Firstly, what I'm going to tell you today is basically the battle account of a battalion, that is an infantry battalion of the Indian Army. Why is it important for you all to know what an infantry battalion did in war? I think any country or any nation that respects its soldiers is a nation which will move forward and progress forward and be a powerful, uh, powerful nation in future. And it also augurs well that when its citizens give interest to tales of valor, courage, sacrifice of a simple soldier in battle, like I already said, it will augur well for the fate of that particular nation. It is also important for you all to know, because this is a very different type of leadership, as has already been brought up and referred to by your chief. Here is leadership, or here is motivation, which is a little different from the motivation that we learn in the management books as defined because I am also uh, some sort of a management guy. You know management means making people do, maybe making people want to do what they want, well, what the management wants them to do. Well, in war, it's not so simple. There are bullets flying very fierce and thick, and here is you sitting under a stone with all this artillery fire coming on, shaking you right down to your bones, and the uh, leg flying thick and hot, so close that you feel scared even nodding your head because you might catch some lead. And at that point of time, to tell a soldier, come on, get up, let's charge, head on, with the enemy sitting down. And the soldier, at that point of time, gets up without a second thought, without arguing and saying, it's not my turn, it's Banda's turn today. <laughs> I think that is the ultimate in motivation. Don't you think so?
When it comes to leadership, leadership comes down to being able to make decisions. They don't have to be the right decisions. You just have to be able to make decisions as well as motivating your men. And that is very important, especially on the battlefield. So I'm glad that he's talking about that a little bit. That I feel is the ultimate in motivation. So we have in the army today, you'll be proud to know in the Indian army, achieved that kind of motivation with the troops. Otherwise, if you really look at it, what is the pay that you're giving a soldier? What are the perks that you're giving to a soldier? You're keeping him in the field area for half his life. His wife and children are suffering down here. Which class is the child is studying, he doesn't know. Because he comes on leave only on, uh, during uh, two months a year. Yet, when the requirement is there, he gets up and faces the bullet and charges in front. So gentlemen, here I would like to bring a point to say, it is just not the money. It is not the perks. It is not just the environment that you are in. It is not the management only that brings about this sort of a motivation. It is much more. It is a commitment, a commitment to your nation. It's a sense of duty. And I think to that end, all of you must also understand that just by doing your duty here is not adequate. You must think. Think and do something for the nation. Think what the soldiers are doing. So the first step towards that direction is to know what the soldiers are doing for you and for the nation. Right. Now coming down to this of Vijay, you would have heard a lot about it, you would have read a lot about it, you would have seen a lot about it in the t on TV and media. But there are a lot of things which you don't know because that's what I'm trying to tell you now. As we all know, somewhere around 5th of May, there was a patrol party which went and when it was going through the areas which are inaccessible or inhospitable during winters, it came under fire from supposedly militants. And when it got stuck there, it was extricated by some battalions and then the complete Operation Vijay came about. Now what is the background to this? In 1965, Operation Gibraltar, that was the name which is given to the operation. It was headed by a General Malik, Malik Kasim, I think, from the Pakistani Army. The plan was very simple. They raised eight force level army, with each force having six columns and each column having six companies and each company having 130 men in it. Which means almost 30,000 troops in all. They raised this army. This army had people from the Razakars, the something like of the, SF, the Rangers, the Mujahids, so-called Mujahids. They are people who are sacrificing for the uh, religion and for that uh, supposedly liberation of Kashmir. Then they had the regulars, regulars from the special forces group to train these men. It was a concocted sort of a plan where few uh, trained the personnel, who were, trained uh, generals who had read lots about Mao's guerrilla tactics and the political type of uh, 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 situation which could be created by these guerrilla tactics. And after having bumped up those books, they thought they would try this sort of a thing with India here. So the training went on proper and even the Chinese are reportedly, uh, they, they reportedly gave them some support on this training. And for about six months they trained in Pakistan and they were released into India. Plan was very simple. They were to infiltrate into India in twos and threes through the border concentrate behind our lines and then hit at vital installations like your TV stations, radio stations, main bridges, destroy them, take over other big industrial uh, uh, installations, hit the police uh, uh, stations, hit the army, cause attrition, 
etc., etc. <coughs> Suffice to say that this thing failed. It failed not because of the lack of efforts. It's because one small thing which they forgot or which they did not cater for was the spirit or the national spirit of the people of Jammu and Kashmir, especially Ladakh region. They were under the impression that once these people start hitting and the tide starts flowing into their direction, the people will rise. They would be given a lot of support in terms of money and arms and they would rise against the government and then it would be a fate of complete where the complete Jammu and Kashmir would then be subjugated under Pakistan. But that did not happen. The people did not respond to their calls. Matter of fact, they helped the Indian army to locate these people and destroy them in detail. One of the grandiose plans at that time was, if you see, if you know a little bit of geography of uh, India and the Jammu and Pakistan side, there is a road which goes from Jammu up to Srinagar, then from Srinagar up to Leh. Now this is the main lifeline for the complete region of Leh Ladakh. There is another road which goes through Ufshi Manali towards the east and then up north towards Srinagar, uh, towards uh, Leh Ladakh. But this road is not fully developed. As far as air is concerned, there is an airport at Leh, but it cannot sustain the amount of supplies and the ammunition that you require to sustain your troops and even the people there. Because six months of the year, this road is closed due to the snow, heavy snow. This pass, this road which goes from Jammu towards Srinagar and Leh goes to a pass called Josila Pass which is shut down six months a year due to heavy snow. So their idea at that time also was to sit down, block this road, Jammu, Leh, uh, Jammu, Srinagar, Leh, cut the complete Leh Ladakh area off and then when the internet, by the time India would react, international intervention would come in and Jammu and Kashmir would be severed altogether. This was the plan. It failed that time. That Is this the same road that they were talking about with the Pakistani generals in the movie Shersha and also they referenced it in the 50 Day War video that I reacted to? It sounds like it might be, but I'm just not sure. If someone wants to clarify in the comments, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. That time when it failed, there was a young very young officer who had just got commissioned and he was part of the special services group. That is a special force of the Pakistani, very elite Pakistan army group. That young officer, this plan was breeding in his mind. And again, in 1999, the plan was during winter months, when the bunkers and the permanent defenses of India are not occupied due to heavy snow, because we moved down during winter and then occupied during summer again. They would quickly come and occupy these areas, make themselves comfortable, take positions, and as the snow melts and the Indian army starts coming up, that time hit them, cause attrition, block the road again and again. By the time we would, uh, uh, we would react, the international intervention would be there and they uh, the complete LC would be realigned and they would take the whole of Leh Ladakh and Jammu and Kashmir, portion of Jammu and Kashmir. So this general again tried the same stuff. That same lieutenant who was there at that time had now become a general. And that general, for your information, General Barres Mushaf. So this was his plan. Right. Now, I have already dwelt upon the slight geography. I will just give you a brief uh, about the general area. Firstly, about the type of enemy that we faced. It is not one enemy that we faced. It is three enemies that we faced. First, first enemy was the weather. Extremely cold. Even at that time, in May, it was minus 28 to minus 32 degrees Celsius. At that kind of temperature, even doing your normal jobs in the morning, becomes extremely difficult. It's a pain. And in that cold, if your naked hand touches your weapons, it gets stuck because of the extreme cold. And it has to be cut and surgically removed. That is the type of cold I'm talking about. Then there are cold-related uh, problems. 
The cold related problems are hypoxia, lack of oxygen, your uh, extreme cold like your chill days, frostbite, hypothermia, you something called pulmonary edema, your uh, cerebral edema, pulmonary edema, your lungs get filled with your own fluid. You don't secrete the fluid. And before you say Jack, you drown in your own fluid. It's the most terrible death. Cerebral edema, your brains get filled with your own fluid. And you start doing all funny sort of things. That Altered mental status. Well, I got a report one fine morning that one Jawan is digging trenches all over. So I said, this boy, even in this cold and difficult uh, place, he is uh, doing such hard work and I was very appreciative. But then we realized he started digging more than five, six trenches. Till evening he was digging from the morning. Then we realized there's something wrong. So he had got that initial stages of that cerebral edema. And of course, before we could do anything, he was no more. So this is the type of uh, disease that you have. The second enemy was the high altitude. Extreme high altitude, 18,000, 17,000 feet. Those of you who are enthusiasts, physical enthusiasts, must have gone to Singer. When you walk and climb Singer, not through the normal route, just straight up like this, on a very difficult or a rainy day, that is like a, what shall we say, a cake walk compared to what you have to negotiate there. It's absolutely like this there. Very, very cold, the wind chill factor, and then the high altitude effects. Hypoxia. Hypoxia, lack of oxygen. Your capability is reduced to about 40 to 50 percent. That is, if you can carry 100 kgs here, you can carry only 40 kgs there. That, and that is just an example. But normally, you cannot carry more than 15 to 20 kgs on your back. The best, the healthiest, the strongest guy. And that too, you got to attack uphill like this. The enemy is sitting on top. And of course, the third enemy was the enemy himself. Well ensconced, well supplied, well trained, sitting right on top of there, dominating you. Now this is the type of odds that we faced. When they talk about he faced they faced heavy odds. This is the type of heavy odds we are talking about. Before you even enjoy the battle, you have already had to fight so many things. So on 5th of May, when we came to know that this has happened and the patrolling party got trapped, that is the time my battalion was coming down from Siachen Glacier, 23,000 feet above sea level. And we thought our advance party had already moved to Pune and uh, people were already thinking how to, you know, what time of the evening we should go to the main street and whether we should go to Chiple Bandhu or Karachi Suites. <laughs> that is the time we came to know that no, it is neither of these. You have to go via Kargil. And we were redirected. My advance party was here. I called them back from right here. When the battle was enjoined in May, I was commanding the uh, Doda Battalion, uh, the Russian Rifle Battalion, fighting against militants in the forests of Doda. And every day it used to be a painful affair. I had a big house all to myself, about six or seven rooms. And every day I had to change my room back where I used to sleep. Because in the evening I used to get rocket attacks, machine gun fire on my place. Because they knew if the commanding officer is killed, how the battle is won. So every day I had to change my room where I sleep. Mm. Because it was surrounded all over by mountains and you cannot sort of keep them away from there. So when I got a chance, this, uh, my colonel of the regiment, General Yadav, who was going to be the deputy chief soon, when he told me, look, uh, first level Gurkha Rifles is there, your father's battalion, and uh, they are in trouble, they are in battle over there, would you like to take over the battalion? I said, yes, I will. But like he said, it was very difficult, not knowing your men, not knowing your JCOs, not knowing your officers, not knowing the terrain, and not knowing the enemy. If you have read Confucius, you must have, uh, you must have uh, knowledge about what he says. I would have lost a hundred battles, but I was lucky. Like I said, fortune favors the brave. I said, I will do it. I, I just counted upon one aspect. I said, my father has commanded this battalion, and I being his son, they know by reputation who I am, and that is good enough. 
and if a man has faith in himself, everything else will open its way. And that's what happened. So I'm going to pause the video right there, and we will continue this in part two, which I'll post tomorrow. Once it's up and published, I'm going to put it right here. Until then, you're going to find another good video. Before I let you guys go, I do want to say that I'm really enjoying this so far, and I can't wait to hear what more he has to tell about his cargo war stories. So far, I think he's a good leader who wants to do his duty. If you got any value from this video, I would really appreciate a like, a comment, a share, a subscribe, hit the thanks button, or just watch more videos. Thanks for watching.